Red Alert is a 1958 novel by Peter Bryant, and depending on your point of view and your geographical location, two thirds of that isn't true. Because Red Alert was originally published in the UK as Two Hours to Doom, and Peter Bryant is a pseudonym of the author Peter George. The back page of this novel claims to be a novel of the first two hours of World War III, which is a great byline, but technically not true either. What is true, however, is that while this novel was the inspiration for Stanley Kubrick's comedy Dr. Strangelove, this is very much a Cold War thriller, and a fairly dark but effective one. The plot is told almost exclusively from three locations. The B-52 bomber, the Alabama Angel, carrying its nuclear warheads into the USSR, Serona Air Force Base, and a briefing room at the Pentagon. Serona's commander, General Quinton, struggling with a terminal illness, has observed the Soviet military's progress and deployment, and predicting an attack, sent his bombers in preemptively. The crew of the Alabama Angel receive their attack orders and proceed on mission, unaware of the various military chiefs and the president's frantic efforts in the Pentagon to withdraw them. This includes ordering a military assault on the Serona base itself. All three of those threads progress to a tense finale where the damaged Alabama Angel limps towards its target, avoiding the Russian fighters and air defences, while the Russian president arms a doomsday device which will render the planet uninhabitable. The stakes then are huge, but while the Doomsday Device and its execution may seem a little far-fetched, the novel generally comes with a decent amount of credibility. Part of that stems from Peter Bryant, who was working for the RAF and drew on his own personal experiences and knowledge in writing the book. Some say that he used the nom de plume in order to circumvent the Official Secrets Act. Part of this is also, however, due to a heinlining and devotion to the equipment and the men involved in this story. This description, fairly lengthy in a novel this brief, doesn't move the story along because the stakes involved in a nuclear war are already clear. It is fair to say though that it adds something to the verisimilitude. The two paragraphs seem to repeat themselves. It's a minor thing because generally the novel is of a brisk pace, but you could argue that the repetition is redundant. However, part of this information is important to the novel. So while Bryant like timeline uses his research and knowledge for a heightened sense of realism what distinguishes the two styles is that Bryant has an understanding of the science whereas Heinlein has a devotion to it further the comparison between the two men can be extended to general quinton whose exchanges with his subordinate lieutenant howard explain his motivations behind beginning an unprovoked nuclear war without authority these exchanges are very reminiscent of the dialogues between some of Heinlein's knowledgeable old men and their charges, be they Professor De La Paz of The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, Colonel Dubois of Starship Troopers, or Dr. Kiku of Starbeast. The difference, again, is that Quinton is not espousing the author's philosophy, but the opposite stance, which you could argue makes him the more interesting character. Certainly his stance has an underlying logic to it, and it draws on contemporary events again for added persuasiveness. Quinton explains how the Russians have developed the initiative in the arms race and are now capable of staging a nuclear attack on America that would render them unable to retaliate. Quinton's plan, simplified by me, is to get the retaliation in first, sending his bombers in under false pretenses and knowing that the damage they do will hamper the inevitable USSR retaliation just long enough for the American command to follow up his initial blow with an annihilating one. This leads to one of the most chilling parts in the novel, where the Pentagon chiefs consider his plan and suggest the most sensible option available to them is to carry out his action to its logical end. Logical, perhaps, but a staggering disregard for the human cost, a viewpoint that Quinton himself doesn't share. He understands that his decision is going to cause damage unparalleled in human history, and the scale of the destruction that he has initiated will likely send him insane. His plan and its motivation almost convince Howard and make Quentin completely convincing as a character, a far cry from his depiction in the movie. The same can be said also of the crew of the Alabama Angel because ignorant, unintelligent men couldn't do any part of this job. The Alabama Angel is crewed by men defined by their competence and capability and, if we're being really picky, not much else. These independent men, highly trained of good educational background, these men are motivated by doing their duty and General Quinton's fabrication that the USSR has initiated a nuclear war. 
they are to be the retaliation to that strike. Yet there is nothing of the anger or the fury that you might expect in such circumstances, just a cool resolve and a business as usual attitude that's kind of at odds with the distinctly unnatural circumstances. As the novel progresses, however, we see a few touches of humanity creep into the crew, particularly Captain Clint Brown, who naturally dominates his aircraft. The B-52 squadrons patrol the sky and are ready to strike against the USSR at any point. They head to what's called an X point, then they receive orders to either turn back or to go on an attack. Naturally, 100% of their missions to this point have called for them to turn back, but still their nuclear armament represents an awesome responsibility, the ability to end several million lives with a single button push. Each mission then is imbued with a great responsibility, but also a degree of fear, as Bryant puts it. Fear for the world rather than themselves. In a very Heinlein moment, Bryant tells us that as single men, the psychological impact of their mission and its potential is lessened for the Alabama Angels crew, but the first dose of humanity interjected into them is the revelation that Clint Brown is no longer single. His fiancée in Seattle is never far from his mind. The stakes then are both incredibly vast, but also deeply personal. How did Seattle look now? High shattered buildings poking a few ferro concrete fingers at a sky loaded with strontium dust. Tarmacs of roads, stone and wood of houses, bone and sinew of human flesh fused into a smooth dead amalgam. Glowing black hair and a tall graceful body, brain and voice and generous loving heart charred into black nothing. The choice at the X point then is monumental. The separation of human existence from the potentially apocalyptic is black and white as is the routine around turning away, a matter of ritual almost carved into stone. The behaviour is also preemptive. Sergeant Garcia reaches for the coffee that the crew will share, and Lieutenant Goldsmith begins his joke. Both commodities are rationed on the B-52, and Brown awaits the completion of that ritual, with his hand on the controls ready to turn away when the code comes through. It's been built up sufficiently that the disruption to their behaviour at its most human lends some extra significance to the moment, as does Captain Brown's decision to maintain the holding pattern manually rather than entrust it to the autopilot. His deviation from the norm mirrors and amplifies the foreboding nature of the extraordinary orders. He concentrated grimly on his instruments, waiting like the rest of the crew, but with a chill presentiment that he already knew what the message would be. Brown's failure to maintain the turn as well as the automation would again hints at humanity, fallibility, the concept that no system is insusceptible to human error or interference, which, while it is also the issue at Sonora Base, where General Quinton has precipitated the crisis by circumventing the checking systems, at the Pentagon the opposite issue is in place. Here, the military minds think alike that the logical next step to Quinton's rogue attack is one which erases their opponent from the map, combatants and civilians alike. Here, the president is the human check on the mechanical apparatus of the military. Even while the generals Franklin and Kepler squabble with each other, they both agree that Quinton's attack should be joined by the military's full might. However, by the novel's end, the two of them, the president and the Russian ambassador, are all working together, and even that may not be enough to prevent Armageddon. The president's fight to avert the catastrophe puts the lie in the assertion of Quinton's that the dog-eat-dog nature of the world, combined with the power of modern weaponry, has made war too dangerous to be left to politicians. The president's stance here echoes the portrayal of JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis in Oliver Stone's biopic, though it precedes those events by some four years. Despite the lengthy flight into Russian airspace and sporadic exchanges of gunfire with ground forces and fighters, this is much more a thriller than it is an action-packed war book. The action is effectively written where it occurs, though. Hot lines of shells stab through the air, clawing at the targets, exploding in vicious red flashes as they hit. And the mounting damage and casualties suffered by the Alabama Angel really adds up to the crew doing something truly heroic, even though we know it's in service of something that is horrific, morally wrong and dishonestly forced upon them, though I guess you can apply that sentence to quite a lot of the fighting through the years. But it doesn't lessen the excitement of the chapters following the B-52 or the feeling that the crew are overcoming the odds against them in a way that's both powerful and moving. While Bryant refers to the Russian bisons as four-jet bombers perhaps a couple of times too often, and this paragraph could have done with a re-edit, 
Overall, Bryant's prose is of a good standard and his book hits all the right notes. Though some characters are scant sketches, those that count Captain Brown and General Quinton particularly are effectively drawn and convincing. Their humanity and politics respectively being credible enough that the necessary emotions are conveyed. The science and political systems portrayed here are also well done. The action is less of a focus, but Bryant energetically weaves the frantic efforts of the politicians with the Alabama Angels' determined approach to his target as the novel builds to a gripping climax. Red Alert is nothing like Kubrick's movie. Far from a satire, it is a tightly plotted and constructed thriller that hits all of the right beats. With its blend of politics, philosophy and action, it would appeal to fans of Robert Heinlein who are prepared to move beyond the sci-fi genre. Red Alert also carries a high degree of realism born from Bryant's time with the RAF, and although this is a novel far slimmer than anything by Tom Clancy, it may well appeal to fans of his Cold War thrillers. It's a pretty difficult book to find, which is why my copy is this cheap knockoff that actually looks rather like it's just photocopied somebody else's book. Um, but if you can track down a copy, it's well worth the effort. That's why the sequel has its thumb up. That means that I thought this book was pretty decent. And if you felt the same about this video, then liking and subscribing is the way to show that. Thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next one.